Hey, have you guys ever heard the term, you become the things you celebrate? Before we actually did get into God's word and what he says, I, I just want to I want to celebrate together. And so if you're at home, however you celebrate, let's let's celebrate together. Every year, our outreach team, our outreach budget team gets together and we talk about uh, some projects, right? So our, our church is committed to giving. We give 10% of all of our uh, uh, tithes and offerings. We give 10% of those back to our community and uh, globally to, to reach people. And so I'm, I'm going to read... 17 projects that we funded in addition to our regular giving and in addition to our COVID giving. And so why don't you celebrate some of these things with me? Check this out. Okay, we, we have helped a church plant in Thailand, one of the most unreached areas of the world. We helped a, a new church plant that is one year old to uh, train them in evangelism and leadership. We've helped Freedom Fire, one of our local outreach partners. We helped them build a basketball court last year, but we're helping them cover it this year so they can minister to scores of children in Section 8 housing. We're helping Victory Soccer Camps. Check this out. It's so exciting. We're helping Victory Soccer Camps. They've done soccer camps all over the Kansas City area. And check this out. They've, uh, in the past 15 years, they've shared the gospel with 15,000 kids and 3,500 of them co have come to faith in Jesus. We've helped one of our uh, church planters in Romania get a permanent facility so they can continue to minister to their community. We've helped the Rachel House minister to some of the most at-risk people for abortion in our community. And they, in the last three years, have shared the gospel with 6,300 people. That's right, 6,300 people. They've ministered to 15,000 men and women to be healthy in pregnancy, and then they've saved 4,859 babies. 4,859 babies. It's incredible. It's amazing. Uh, j just a, a quick note, too. Uh, if you've been involved in abortion, uh, man or woman, do you know that Jesus loves you? He wants to minister to you. He wants to heal you. He wants to be a part and enter into some of that brokenness. And there are people across our very own city that are there to help you. So you can, you can actually email outreach at visitgracechurch.com if you're looking uh, for some of that care. So just that was just a quick note. Now back, back to the, uh, some celebration here. Uh, we helped our church planter in Kurdistan stay in Kurdistan so he can uh, minister, so their family can minister to 33 million Kurds that only 0.01% of them believe. We've helped a church planter in Morocco with their language learning so they can share the gospel accurately in their own dialect. We've helped uh, uh, some people down at the KU campus minister and have gospel events on the campus because we all need we all know that those Jayhawks need Jesus badly. Okay. We also funded Shelter KC, formerly known as Kansas City Rescue Mission, as uh, we helped them fund uh, 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 they bought air conditioning units. I know it's not as exciting, but they can continue to minister to the fifteen hundred homeless that they minister to every year. We helped a team in India. I know there's a ton, so keep hanging with me, okay? Hang with me. We funded a team in India to see India revolu revolutionized by the gospel from the wealthiest Brahmin to the most forgotten street child. They're learning the language so they can share the gospel with the most unreached area in the world. We're helping Ray of Hope with Bibles and emergency uh, kids help, discipleship training, and jungle pastor training. We're helping a church plant in Spain. Uh, they are ministering in an area that it's said that there's more caffeine in a decaf cup of coffee than there are Christians in Spain. We're helping a village in Afghanistan get the gospel among a village that's 300,000 people, and there is not one known follower of Jesus there, and we're doing something about it. We're helping pastor serve fund three cross-cultural cohorts, they're called cohorts, to promote unity and the love of Christ in our city across racial, geographic, and ethnic boundary lines. 
We're helping the seed company finish 10 translations of the Bible in 10 different languages so people can have the Bible with them in their own language. We're helping a group minister to women in the Middle East. We're helping another group in Nepal, training pastors that are planting in the most remote areas where, church, where the church doesn't yet exist. And so check this financial breakdown with me. In, in that pro- project proposal, it's the most we've ever given in projects. And we gave $229,000 away. $229,000. 157,000 is going to go towards reaching unreached people groups. I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, 131,000 is going towards church planting. And this year alone, it's a record for grace. Even in a COVID season, we have given away three quarters of a million dollars. That's $750,000 away. So our, our, our cities and our communities can hear the name of Jesus so they can follow him all over this world. And so celebrate with me. I can hardly believe it. It's incredible. And uh, it only happens through your giving. And so thank you so much uh, for doing that. Okay, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So wherever you're at, grab your Bibles on your phone, where uh, just the paper copy. You remember the old paper copy that you could hear noise when you turn the pages? Make sure you grab that. Okay. So so think about this for just a second with me. Okay, so we give, but that's what the church is supposed to do. That's what the church is supposed to do. It's supposed to be this this beacon of light. This beacon of light is that's getting the gospel to com- our communities, our city, in our world and as Grace Church, we are we are doing it. We're doing it with our finances, but are we exemplifying the go? which is what we're talking about this week in our growth path, the connect, the growth, and the the going, right? Connect, grow, go. So we're talking about go, but think about his kingdom with me. Like his kingdom, it's not a a kingdom full of structures and and buildings, but it's a kingdom of unity, of healing, of purpose, of of nations changing, of peace, of love. It's a for caring for one another. It's It's a lack of strife. It's It's a place where revival is taking place. It's a place where there's joyful obedience. It's a place where marriages are on mission. It's a, it's a, it's a kingdom of openness. It's a kingdom of vulnerability. It's a kingdom where people are reached. It's a kingdom where racial reconciliation doesn't even exist because all races have been reconciled under the kingship of who Jesus is. See, our kingdom in, in the dictionary of our kingdom, the term unreached doesn't even exist. See, it's, his, his kingdom is not a kingdom of outrage. It's not a kingdom of cancel culture. But, but the gospel, see, the gospel does these miraculous things. And the things I've just described are just tiny glimpses. And so we're going to check out more of his kingdom. If you grab your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, at all the other campuses, I've uh, asked everybody to stand. So you can engage right now by standing, even to read God's word with me. And so I'm going to read it, and then we're going to walk through it. Okay, so re- read it with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. He says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, for Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you just reveal what we need to see in this? Would you Would you show us yourself? Would we see your face, God? Would you move us with your word? Would you you have it uh, uh, come into our hearts and and change us for, for eternity, forever? 
for your honor, for your namesake, for your glory, so all nations and all peoples can hear this great gospel, this good news. Pray all these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. So verse 3, I remember the first time I, I taught this verse, I instead of saying uh, uh, veiled, I said uh, veiled, like a, a, a deer cutlet, sort of weird. But anyways, that, that, that was beside the point. So verse 3, okay? But even if our gospel is veiled, even if it's hid, it is hid, veiled, to those who are perishing. Right? So this gospel we have, it's the, the proclamation of the grace of God. It's the proclamation, the saying of the grace of God in the gospel. So we're sharing Jesus, this gospel, the good news. And it's hid, and, and it's hid what is, we're going to find out in verse 4, it's hid because we have an enemy, but it's hid to those that are perishing. Those that, that are d- going to be destroyed, this gospel, if, it, if it's not your gospel, the, the scripture right says it, that you were declared to be put to death. There's no hope. I mean, absolutely no hope without this gospel. Without the good news of what Jesus has done, there is no hope. And he, he says this amazing little word right here, our. He says, if our gospel, it's personal, it's mine, it's, it's something that I want to dwell on, it's something that I want to think about, it's something that I want to have on my mind. Because why? Because people are perishing. Because they're being destroyed. Because they will die without Christ. And how does this happen? Verse 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. The God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds, the minds of people who do not believe. What's the light of the glorious gospel? The the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So we have this enemy, and this enemy doesn't want the church to be a beacon of light. He doesn't want the church to be a beacon of light. He wants to obscure the truth. He wants to hide the truth. Or he wants you to get led back to self. He hides the truth. And he blinds people's minds. And he gets their minds on things that don't matter. And the things like a a big house and a car and a career and a perfect family. Although some of those things are are nice and some of them are, are good. But when they're our number one objective, all of a sudden they become... Uh, they obscure who Jesus is. And we've got this battle, this, this battle over the mind, but this battle is won when you see. Like when you see who Jesus is, the battle is won. See, we have this, this hope. We have this hope in something called the gospel of the glory of Christ. And when we see this gospel with our, with our eyes, the battle all of a sudden isn't a battle anymore because it has been won. So how is this battle actually won? Verse 5, he says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. He says we do not preach ourselves. The way that light is shown is through the preaching of God's Word. And I'm not just talking about on a Sunday morning or, or a, a weekend, but actually all the time. And we'll get to some more of that here in a second. But a preacher is a public crier, a proclaimer, a, a, a herald. Listen, I have seen all kinds of pastors and church planters and people. They've called people to themselves. Because they've preached themselves and they're trying to gather people to to follow them. They want people to to follow them. And and then I see all over, especially right now, we see see messages and things preached all over social media and the news and all of these things. There's messages being preached. But we have this message, the most hopeful, grace-filled, loving message in the person of Jesus, yet we're afraid. See, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense when we have the most hopeful message. We've got an amazing message, and it's not even of ourselves. We're not calling people to ourselves, but we're, we're calling people to Christ. We have no power. You and I have, we have no power whatsoever. We never had any power, but Jesus has given us 
His power through the preaching of His Word. And so we don't, we don't preach ourselves. In fact, I, I don't want people to even remember me. I don't want you to remember me. I actually, I want you to like forget me. And I, I, I want, but I do want to be this link. Like this link in the chain that, that grabs the generation that's behind me and that, that grabs the, the generation that's in front of me. And, and I, I say, you know what? Christianity and following Jesus continues because I've been faithful. I, in fact, I don't know if anybody know who William Carey is. Why don't you tell your mom or dad or why don't you say, yeah, I know who William Carey is out loud. Okay, William Carey was the father of modern missions. He went to India and, and he, he said this. He says, a wretched Poor worm am I. On thy kind arms I fall. See, William Carey started a gospel movement. And he realized who he really was. How about Count Zinzendorf? Anybody know who Count Zinzendorf is? He started the Moravian movement. And on his gravestone, it's said to say, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Man, that would be awesome. Nobody's going to remember Justin Raby in 50 years. I'm okay with that. But, man, if people can continue the chain of the gospel, because I'm standing in the gap and saying, I'm going to preach the greatest message in the world. I don't want anybody to remember me. I don't care. Forget me, but remember who Jesus is and preach who He is. Preach Him, die, and be forgotten. Oh, hey, hey, uh, uh, Raby, isn't that too extreme? Isn't that too extreme? No, it's not too extreme. Sometimes I, I don't call you high enough. We should call each other high enough. Why? Because of verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts, like hang on this passage, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, and it's shown in the face of Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't that incredible? Like, isn't that remarkable? See, the, the scripture calls Jesus in, in Malachi chapter 4, the son of righteousness, S-U-N, the brightness, the glory, the son of righteousness. See, he's the commander of the light. He's the one that created the light in Genesis chapter 1. He is the light. He has the power. And he entered into darkness to shine his light. But not only did he enter into his darkness, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 says, For you were darkness. You were darkness. Like you and I, we were darkness, not in darkness. We were the darkness. We were sinful, depraved, idolatrous, self-worshippers. You know, the word darkness actually means shady. We were shady. You were straight up shady. And he enters in. This is why the gospel is so shocking. This is why the gospel is so shocking. He is the son of righteousness. Do you know him? He is the commander of the light. Do you know him? He has the power to shine light in darkness. Do you know him? He has shown us his son. Do you know him? Because if you know him, you tell others about him. You tell others about Him when you know Him because He has entered into our darkness and we realize how sinful and depraved and messed up and broken we really are. That's why we read verse 7. Sorry, I'm pointing at you guys a lot. I know. Sorry. Forgive me. If you have problems, email timhowie at visitgracechurch.com, okay? All right, verse 7. So we have this treasure, the treasure of Jesus the treasure of the light of the glorious gospel of Christ in earthen vessels. What are those earthen vessels, y'all? Like the broken down, cracked messes that, that holds the treasure of who Jesus is inside of us. Can you believe it? It's, it's almost unbelievable. 
It's almost unbelievable. I think he did that because he knew if he put us, if, if we were like pretty vessels, you know, and I'm not talking about body image or anything like that. I'm saying like if we were just morally perfect and, and already righteous, we would take credit. But I know me. I know my thoughts. I know my sinful tendencies. I know, I know the things that I've done. And I can't take credit for Him placing this treasure inside me and inside you if you're a blood-bought, loving follower of Jesus. So check this out. If we have this treasure, then we should make it our joyful ambition. Our joyful ambition to, to share the treasure that we have. That's why Paul in Romans chapter 15 says, I have made it my ambition I've made it my ambition to preach Christ where Christ has not been named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. See, he, he said, I've made it my ambition. Like, I've made it my singular aim. My only aim in life is to, to preach Christ, to preach Jesus. I've made it my singular aim, and it's to preach Christ not on a stage or not even over, over uh, uh, an online service, but, but, but to preach on Tuesday to my kids to preach on Thursday at my workplace, to preach on Friday in my neighborhood when I'm hanging out with my neighbors. So preach. You know, I, I used to mentor uh, quite a few uh, young men. And uh, w- when I would ma- mentor them, I always sort of look at them and I, I'd get this smirk on my, my face. You know those smirks that like, I know something you don't know. And I, I'd get this smirk and I'd say, you think you're at your job to make money. You're not at your job to make money. You're at your job to, to, to magnify and show the face of Jesus. That's why you're there. You're probably the only follower of Jesus at your workplace. And if there are other followers there, I mean, lock arms with them and say, you know what, we're going to take this. We're going to take this company for the kingdom of God. and We're going to share Jesus. You should continue making money there, but, but you should be there for the singular aim to study and to know this Jesus. How, how could Paul say this? Like, how could Paul really say, I've made it my ambition to preach Christ where Christ has not been named? See, I think Paul realized who he was. I think Paul realized that, that he was a sinner. I think Paul realized that he was a killer of Christians. I think he realized that he was arrogant and proud and steeped in religion. I think he realized that, that he robbed the synagogue as a Pharisee and ate the finest foods and then he acted religious so he could get gain. But you know why I think he really said it? Because I think he knew that the treasure of Jesus lived inside him. Like the actual treasure of Jesus lived inside him. I think he really knew how sinful he was in that he was forgiven. Like his sins were purged. That word purged, he was cleansed. He, all his sins were wash away, washed away. They disappeared. They disappeared. And listen, the world, the world needs us. The world needs us to, to make it our singular aim to share this Jesus with people. To share our gospel with people. The world is depending upon it. You know why? Because there are 3.2 billion people that are considered unreached. Okay, I'm going to get a dorky missiologist on you for just a second. Okay, so I remember actually 3.2 billion people. So this term unreached, okay, it's, it's a huge number. And the term unreached means you're of the same people group, the same language, same culture, and the population is less than 2% gospel-believing evangelical followers of Jesus. Okay, so that's 2%. So 500 million people in India alone... 500 million people in India alone have no idea. They've never even heard the name of Jesus. Never even heard it. That's why they're considered unreached. I remember when I started this thing 15 years ago in missions. I've been in sort of that missions world for 15 years. Listen, it was only 2.9 billion when I started. Yo, we're, we're, we're going in the wrong direction. We're going in the wrong direction. See, these, these, these people in India, they've never even heard his name. Like, they've never even heard the name Jesus. Jesus, how beautiful is that, that name? There's no, no, there's no other name 
in heaven, on earth, or even under the earth that a person is saved by except this name, Jesus. And we hear it all the time, but guess what? We are doomed without Him. Like we're doomed without Him. And if we're doomed without Him and we've heard His name, what about those 500 million people? What about the 3.2 billion people? They're doomed without Him because they, they don't have the gospel. See, if your version, if your version of Christianity is not worth sharing, you don't have the right version. You don't have the right version. They say, people say, Justin, but 3.2 billion, that's overwhelming. What am I supposed to do about that? You know what you do? You share the gospel with your kids. You share the gospel with the people you work with. You share the gospel with people in your neighborhood. It doesn't matter at the grocery store. You share it because it's the most life-giving. It's the most life-giving wonderful message. Don't be soft in your witness. Like, Don't be soft. And I'm not just talking about inviting people to church, but keep doing that. Like invite, invite, invite. Invite people to church. Bring them with you. Share the gospel with them. You will, uh, we want you to do that, but also just like open your mouth. You know, I'll never forget uh, when I, I was sharing, I've shared with all of my bosses in the marketplace. And I remember the first time I was working at Sutherland's Lumber Company, a guy named Cecil. And uh, I remember hopping in a car with him and uh, I just took an opportunity to share it with him. I had no idea if he would tell me to leave, if he'd fire me, I had no idea, but I shared it with him. And I did it at my next workplace and I worked there five years and I would just share it constantly with everybody. It's not about me, but it's about sharing in the marketplace. For some reason, for some reason, He's entrusted you and I to take the gospel message, the good news, to people all over this world. He's entrusted us to persuade people. See, you can go, you can send, or you can disobey. you got to go. Listen, we're not all missionaries, but we're all on mission. See, the, the, the beauty, you know, I'm not trying to guilt you in this. I'm trying to grace you because, because just like uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I believe, I believe if we savor, like if we savor and enjoy an accurate view of God, if we enjoy an accurate view of God, it will lead us to a joyful obedience. A joyful obedience that says, it doesn't matter if I'm in suffering or in a time of abundance, because I see Jesus. I realize that I'm a sinner, that I've, I've broken His law. I'm, I'm nothing like Him, but yet I've confessed and I believe who He is. Uh, then I want to tell people about Him. What's the one tangible step you can take to use the name of Jesus in a conversation? Listen, check this out. This is so encouraging. See, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. If you've been called into His marvelous light, you want to share that marvelous light. See, one of the greatest sins in church history is apathy. When people are apathetic. See, you cannot come face to face with Jesus and be apathetic. It's impossible. You can't. See, the gospel is so remarkable. It's so, so amazing because it enters into all of life. It enters into divorce. It enters into unreached people groups. It enters into racism. It enters into the outrage culture and divorce and everything. Wayward children, marriage. It enters into everyday life. And we cannot be apathetic about the gospel because it's the good news. We can't be apathetic about it. See, His name is so great. If His name is so great, then why are we not speaking it? Why are we not shouting it from the rooftops? And I think it's because we haven't actually had an accurate view of who God is and what we've been saved from and what we've been saved to. He has put Himself inside of us. The glorious gospel of God that is shown through the face of Jesus. 
Don't just say God to people. Say Jesus loves you and He wants to know you. And right now, the conversation I'm having, He wants to reach you. See, even memorize 2 Corinthians 5.15. It says that He died for all. That they which live should no longer live unto themselves, but unto Him that died for them and rose again. Will you use that in a conversation this week? Like, will you share it? Listen, if, if somehow, if somehow you're here, you're watching right now in your living room, in the car, even on a podcast later, we do have a podcast channel, okay? Even if you're listening, listen, I don't know how you got here, but if you're not a, a blood-bought, loving follower of Jesus, would you just give your life to Him? Just give your life to Him. Say, it's not my own. My life's not my own. It's all yours. Give it all to Him. Just do it. Okay, hop on the Connect card on the app or email us, whatever you have to do, and say, I gave my life to Jesus today. Do it. Okay, do that. All right, where do we go from here? If you've already given your life to Jesus, where do we go from here? I think we're going to have some of these things pop up. And so uh, check this out. Have a spiritual conversation. Have a spiritual conversation with somebody using the name of Jesus this week. Two, go and share the gospel wherever you are because you're right there. It doesn't matter if it's your neighborhood, workplace. What happens if I get fired, Justin? Get fired for the glory of God. Like, go and do it. If that statement bothers you, come, come find me. Come, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'd love to talk to you about what that means, okay? Uh, maybe you need to go serve our local, local partners, Mission Southside, Freedom Fire, any of those local partners. Go serve them. You can find that stuff on our uh, website, visitgracechurch.com slash events. Go on a mission trip. Out, uh, email outreach at visitgracechurch.com. Go to Thailand. Go to India. Go to Brazil. Go to any of our mission trips. Romania. We've got plenty of them, okay? And then lastly, come to my house. Well, not everybody... Not everybody, but, but if you're interested in church planting or being a missionary, I want to invite you over to my house. Okay, Why? Uh, I, I stole this idea from a pastor up north. He said a lot of people just came to his house so he could see what a pastor's house looked like. Don't do that. Don't do that. But, but if you're interested in being a church planter or missionary, come over. Uh, uh, we're going to put the address up. We call, we call it Missions at the Rabies. Uh, if a if hundred people show up, listen, we'll take the furniture and put it in the garage. We'll all sit on the floor and this is what we want to do, okay? November 8th, 6 p.m., tell other people, we, Amy and I want to find out who you are. We want to say we're behind you. We want to feed you. We want to stir you up with God's word. We want to sing with you. We want to pray with you. We want to dream with you. And lastly, uh, the, and this is a stretch, but I want to pray for you by name every day of 2021. So make sure you, you come if you're interested in the, any of those two things. So we've got five things we can do. Maybe you need to go with one of our church planters. There's an extra one, 5.1, right? 5.1. Uh, anyway, so right here, we're going to end with this. Are you savoring an accurate view of God that leads you to joyful obedience?